Hi, it's Megan. I have been putting a novel online called Masks, and it's about makeup and the masks we wear. And I'm now at chapter eight. I've kind of been, I don't know, a little slow on this. I apologize, but I've just been really busy, and it's not easy writing a novel. And I've already given up the idea that I'm not going to revise it massively because, gosh, as I change one thing, something earlier on should change, and I just have different visions for what I want. So this is not a final draft. This is a first, maybe a second draft since I do proof and correct it before I put it on. And in chapter eight, I'm trying something different. I wrote it and then I rewrote it and I kept with the same ending and I don't know that I agree with the way I end this chapter. So I think it's like 90% sure I'm gonna change it, but I wanted to get feedback. So anyone who watches this and thinks I should change the ending, please let me know. I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna change it so you can vote A or B. Um, I will put links to the earlier chapters in the description of this and then I'll put the text to this on my blog and a link to that in the description. So basically up till now, if you haven't seen the earlier chapters, I have a heroine, Lisa, who has started a makeup company and since I'm doing makeup videos, let's see where did I get that from. I just figured it was kind of a tie into the videos and she is from a single mother household, grew up in Los Angeles where I live just because it's easier to write about where I live. And her mom was an Estee Lauder employee for her entire life, and that's where she kind of got her interest in makeup. And I pulled that in just because I feel like makeup and Estee Lauder in particular had this theory, makeup makes women feel better about themselves and empowers them. But it also creates a mask. So Lisa's had a fight with her boyfriend. She's having some problems getting funding for her company, which she's about to expand. And then her mother has a stroke. So her brother, older brother, flies from Northern California to spend time with both of them. So now they've left the hospital, or no, they haven't left the hospital at this point. She's gone back to work because her mom insisted, because um, she had an important meeting. And so now it is, what is going to happen next? So chapter eight. I skip yoga, of course, and Ron, that's her brother, and mom, me, join Ron and mom at Cedars for dinner. Cedars is the hospital. There's no way I could ignore a stroke and a visiting brother just to relax. Even I can acknowledge that life isn't always about me. Escape isn't always an option when someone needs us more. We have sushi that, because that's what mom wanted. I like raw fish. I could have died. Sushi and champagne, please. She declared on the phone while Ron did nurse duty in the hospital as I finished my production meeting. We got an okay on our delivery schedule, but only barely and after begging. I felt exhausted as I left the office, heading into brutal Los Angeles rush hour traffic back to Cedars and my mom. I picked up some sushi en route, stopping at a small restaurant famous for its set course dinner. My mom loves their crab roll and sashimi with ponzu sauce. Since our company policy is always to have a few bottles of pink champagne in our fridge, we are a makeup company after all, that addition was an easy one. I pulled into the multi-level parking structure for the second time and marveled at how many people this hospital served. We don't think about it until suddenly we find ourselves in the emergency room, scared but stuck. The balance between life and death is more precarious than we like to think. I parked my car and charged up the elevator. Better to pretend to be brave and will myself into it. Ron had been texting me all afternoon and the news hadn't been good. Mom was having issues moving her left side and her speech was slurring more and more, which I didn't understand. It was a small secondary stroke after you left and before I arrived, he'd explained. That factor increased my guilt, even though I know that my presence couldn't, wouldn't have stopped a stroke. But I still felt I should have been there, right? Brad, her boyfriend, whom she had a fight with, never called to apologize for being an asshole. Not that he would, as he never saw anything wrong with his approach. And I didn't call him, my boyfriend, to let him know that my mom almost died. Another weakness in our relationship, glaringly obvious, when I just couldn't stand his voice on the other end of a phone line as I dealt with my emergency. But shouldn't I call him when I have a crisis? Isn't he my rock and source of comfort? Apparently not. Quite frankly, I'm relieved that I didn't need to deal with him in the midst of everything else. The good news is that with our production schedule now on track, my company just might make it, Brad and his money or not. I did bump into Dr. Essis as I wandered down the long gray hallway to my mom's room. He smiled and I saw those beautiful white teeth. He looked more tired than he had earlier. The shadows under his eyes were darker. She's okay, but there were some complications, he said. Apparently unyielding and delivering bad news as befit his job. I don't envy him. While I'd been negotiating delivery of powders, he'd been dealing with my mom and her second stroke. I heard was all I could respond. The harsh fluorescent light cast otherworldly shadows on his dusky skin and I tried to look hopeful. It wasn't his fault that my mom's health was failing. Doctors try to solve the most important problems we have, then they go on to their next crisis. Seems grim, but rewarding both. 
She's starting to lose functions, he'd responded. Her speech and left side is likely going to get worse. We got her in time on the first go-round, but there's nothing to prevent further strokes. I stared at him and heard the busy commotion of the people as nurses rushed around us an occasion pass, and an occasional patient passed by. Outside it was darkening. The summer sun cast slightly cast... The summer sun slightly overcast and night cooling. His scrubs were impeccably clean and crisp, and for a second I wondered if I should create an eyeliner that color. Then I focused on reality, not my color-based escapes. I'd always needed the, my other worlds, but for today they'd have to await my escape from this reality, which wasn't going anywhere and was just too important. I know, I said, and just stared back into those deep chocolate eyes. I sensed their compassion, but was too confused for now to know for sure. Heading into my mom's room, even though he was in front of me, none of this felt real. Attractive, yes, and perhaps everything I could have wanted in a man, but really, I was here in this hospital out of fear and desperation, not need. Cracking a smile, I edged my way away. I edged away and excused myself. What's wrong with me? I'm going to her now. Hopefully, you'll be headed home soon so you can handle tomorrow's emergencies. To his credit, Dr. Essis just gave me a half smile and left me on my course. As I pushed her door open, I saw her sitting with Ron. My brother looked worried, and my mom looked a lot worse, despite her perfectly applied blue-based red lipstick. Mom, I tried not to choke as I spoke, then I hugged her and whispered, I'm sorry, into her lavender-scented hair. Hours later, Ron and I got drunk. Champagne led to wine, then tequila, and I knew that I'd hate myself in the morning, but for tonight I was almost coping. Ron is a pain of an older brother, wonderful but also challenging. Three years older than me, he never wavers. That confidence of this kid from the earliest age always drove me nuts. I faked it a lot, as scholarship kids learn to do pretty quickly, but inside I was always fearful that I couldn't measure up to the kids in the big houses with parents who helped them get jobs and other opportunities. In contrast, not, Ron never cared about his environment or forces outside his control. Instead, and still today, he pushes past any resistance and doesn't notice the battle scars. He always tells me that we're lucky we had to work so much harder. You always only value what you need to work to attain, he still lectures. Nothing that comes too easily ever means much. Some of these kids don't need to work, and the problem is that they know it, he'll say. Growing up, I had to wonder at his strength. Was it inborn or the result of growing up fatherless as a fatherless little boy who learned early that no one had his back? Ron funded my first lipstick with its odd job funds before my best friend's parents came in and took responsibility for two and three. Even tonight, he looks confident as I watch him drink tequila, neat and in a UCLA mug. She'll be okay, he tells me. He's reclining on my green velvet sofa, emerald with a dark and paisley pattern and very worn. I keep my favorite items until they fall apart, and this one looks worn. And as, and as I can see both the beauty and age of my sofa, I know to see past Ron's bravado. Occasionally the mask falls, and tonight I see the act, so I shake my head at him. I live in a small and very old two-bedroom house built in the 1920s when everything was smaller. The couch is my living room, and it's, as it's so large, it takes over. I don't have room for chairs, just a small table. And that table is now littered with glasses and the few remnants of the chocolates we had as dessert. Ron smiles more than I do. He kids me about being too serious, but I'm just more honest about it. We're both driven as hell and want to escape our past. Serious chips on our shoulders? Hell yes. Tonight, he's in loose jeans and a logo t-shirt advertising his company. Their main colors are a ragged navy and a matted red. Muted, muted red. Personally, I like to see something more eye-catching, but it isn't my company. Ron has watched me shake my head at him, taking him on in a subtle kid sister sort of a way. We've interacted in the same manner for so long now, but I guess we both sense that something profound is changing. He just stares at me now. I sit sip my own tequila, and wrap my fingers around the white logo mug. Ron is about to ask a tough question. I sense it coming. My lights are dim, and the walls are a cool gray with white trim. I'd kept the room, indeed the house, simple. To me, it's soothing. Why were you with that asshole, he asks. I told him about the fight with Brad, and now, protective big brother he is, he's following up. Well, I guess technically, I'm still with him, I say, hugging my knees close. and glad I changed into baggy sweats. I needed him then. I continue and sit now at my wine, ignoring the tequila. I was young and just starting a company. He was older and wiser, and I was just plain scared. And I shift on the couch, uncomfortable, unsure. Ron is right, but I've never seen that reality so clearly like I, can suddenly, like I suddenly can now. It's been five years, and he seems to take more than he gives, Ron says. My brother's eyes are intent. I see his concern for me, but don't have a response. Dump him. He doesn't even know what happened to you today. Getting out isn't that easy. I try. Sure, it's a weak argument, but we all use it, and let's be honest, it is true. 
Getting out when you feel stuck in a relationship takes courage, and I'm not feeling brave tonight. Eventually, we suddenly realize that we need to be free, but until then, it's just pain and suffering. Hopefully, I broke today, crying on my brother's shoulder and not even telling my boyfriend as my mom suffers. Get out, dump the bastard, he replies, and I watch him sip at his tequila, and I'm glad he's here tonight. He'll sleep on the couch because we need each other, and a hotel would just be too far apart. But will that solve much? How is mom doing? I guess so. I guess it's time, I say. Ron watches me, and I can see him running for the kill. No, I can't defend Brad, but I'm not really up for a fight, so I try to beat him to the punch. We never had a dad. I guess by being with an older man who was so sure of himself, I gained a surrogate father. I needed it five years ago, I said. That was then, Ron said, replies. He gazes away, then meets my eyes again. The light is dim enough that I can't read his expression. Now you'll move on, Ron says, and hands me my cell phone. Drunk, obedient, I take it. So much for the strong CEO story Muse tries to sell the press earlier today. Now I'm just being a passive wimp and doing as I'm told. And as he watched, I dialed the number. But Brad doesn't answer his cell, and I got voicemail. My mom had two strokes today and is in Cedars, I say, then hang up. Who knows what he's up to and why he isn't answering the phone at 10 p.m. Who cares? I, I just can't leave a voicemail, I tell Ron, tomorrow. Ron is watching me, and then his, then his cell ri rings. I watch his eyes register the number. I think it's the hospital, he says. Now he looks frightened, and I know that I am. So I watch him feeling suddenly cold as he listens to the caller. This is where I might change it. She's dead, he asks. As he leans back into the couch and stares at the ceiling, his fingers weaving together in an almost prayer. Tears begin forming in my eyes, but they seem somehow not real, as if I'm feeling them happen to me and not a part of me. And I pick up my, cell, my phone again in a haze, but oddly driven, and redial. She died, I whispered. And so is his relationship. We're done. That might cost you your funding, Ron says, ever the problem solver, even now. But I'm crying, and so is he. The night is over for us, extinguished by God, when he doused the wick that was my mother. She'll never wear my lipstick again or hold me or share my smile. I can only wonder at the gaping hole opening up inside me. Ron pulls me close, and we cry together. We both eventually fall asleep on the couch, and suddenly dawn comes, leaving us both stiff and no less sad. But Brad never returns my call. So let me tell you why I might change it. So that's the end of chapter eight. I might change it because I just don't think I want this book to be about death. I just, I think that I want it to be a more uplifting book. And you know, my heroine has to suffer a lot in the beginning of the book because something needs to get resolved by the end. But I don't think she needs to suffer the death of her mother. So I think she should just get thrown a bunch of problems and as she finds her way out of them, she's going to discover her strength. This problem, I think, doesn't belong in the book. Anyway, if anyone has any thoughts, please let me know. Oh. And I forgot to say, please subscribe on YouTube. And then I have a new book, Escape, which is a terrorist novel. If you like terrorist novels, it's at Amazon. Get it. If you don't, please don't. Okay.